Uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, of course, thanks to Sonia and uh, BFP for, for organizing these events. Uh, this is the closing session, and after that, I hope you will be able to enjoy a bit of Indian summer in Belgrade at last. Um, we have uh, uh, an impressive uh, list of panelists here. Uh, Mr. Svilanovic was the first foreign minister of the post Milosevic's uh, Serbia and is currently the head of an organization called the Re Regional uh, Cooperation Council, which is doing quietly doing a lot of good work in binding together what has been broken in the 90s. Mr. Franco Frattini, the former foreign uh, minister of Italy, who is uh, now uh, a head of um, Italian Society for in, uh, interna international, international Organization. Uh, then uh, Renziliani from the Tirana's uh, Media Institute. Uh, Boris Stadis, who definitely doesn't need introduction of, after being president of Serbia for eight difficult years. And um, last but not the least, uh, Mr. Jacques Rupnik, who is a Harvard scholar and the head of uh, the uh, Institute for uh, uh, Social, uh, sorry, sorry for, for International Research and Studies. Is, it, is this right? Anyway, I have decided to step a little bit away from the protocol. Uh, the title of this panel is uh, Balkans 2020, but before we go to, to the region, I would like to ask the two uh, panelists who are not actually from the region, uh, strictly speaking, in, in Mr. Rupnik's uh, case, um, to say a couple of words about uh, Europe 2020, because we really, all, all the, the, the countries in the Balkans uh, are aspiring to become European Union members, and uh, some will become sooner, some later, but one thing is definitely certain, Europe. European Union that Serbia or Albania will be getting into is not going to look very much in, in 10 or more years, is not going to look that much uh, like, like today's Europe. There are difficult challenges. Um, in a recent interview, Mr. Rupnik has uh, warned that the core of Europe is in danger, that the Franco-Anglican uh, core of Europe is, 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 is now not as firm as before. There are many, many challenges. So I would like to ask Mr. Rupnik and Mr. Fratini just to give a short outline of how do they see developments of the European Union within the next several years. <coughs> Mr. Rupnik, would you start? Oh, it's me. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, it is good actually to start with where I didn't expect, that is not from the region, but uh, trying to look from uh, uh, from the European Union. And the uh, first general statement, one would say, is, I think, a great success story of the EU engagement. What is happening now in the region, really, I mean, would not have been happening without uh, the EU engagement. So whatever else is wrong with the EU today, and often criticized and, 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 and rightly so for its failings, this, is a, this can be a major achievement, the way it has uh, helped to bring about, let's say, new state of mind, cooperation, new political perspective, and I call that making Balkan nationalism Euro-compatible. You know, I didn't believe that only liberal Democrats, pro-Europeans will be doing the European integration. European integration in the Balkans actually is, you know, moving from radical nationalism to more moderate nationalism, and then from moderate nationalism to Euro-compatible nationalism. This is what happened in Croatia with Sanader and the HDZ. This is what's happening in this country now, and the formidable progress we have on the Serbia-Kosovo issue. Others will talk about it and are more qualified to do so, but I think EU can claim some credit for that. Now, that brings me to the uh, uh, second point, is that uh, if you're looking at 2020, it's uh, not easy nowadays to make a case for further enlargement of the EU because of its own internal crisis. You know, it is not easy to expand to the periphery if the core itself is in doubt or searching for a way out of its crisis. So there you have, uh, I see, three main obstacles from the European uh, uh, perspective vis-a-vis -vis the Balkans. And I'm simply going to mention them. 
and uh, sorry if I'm starting with obstacle rather than simply, but I said the cheerful thing, I started with that, so I can, I can mention some obstacles even at the, at the risk of uh, spoiling the, uh, uh, the, 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 the upbeat mood of this conference. Uh, first obstacle, not the most serious, is uh, the legacy of Romania and Bulgaria accession. If you ask within the EU, and I'm not discussing now the merits of the case, the general response is, this was premature, they were not ready, the rule of law is not functioning, they didn't have independent justice, etc. So this is one message towards uh, 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 the, the, the rest of the region. Second uh, obstacle, let's call it for short, the Greek factor. The first Balkan country to join the EU was Greece, 30 years ago. And the European crisis today is very much in public perception, but also in very concrete matters. Discovery that Greece, after 30 years, does not have a functioning state. The, the theme of this conference is building states, reconstructing, deconstructing, kind of derrida, kind of influence, perhaps, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, 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 in Belgrade. Uh, he, would, uh, he would be interested in that, having his word of deconstruction adopted here. Anyway, you discover that after 30 years in the EU, they have no functioning state, no cadaster, no tax collection that is worse off, et cetera, et cetera. So this is like the worst advertisement for extending to the region, you know, because each time I say, I make my usual plea for extending to the Balkans, immediately I get, what? Look at Greece. You want 10 others like that? <laughs> Etc. So Greece is not, Greece was 2003 Saloniki summit. Europe endorses, makes the commitment uh, to the Balkans. 10 years after, Greece is the main sort of in the public perception, is and in the political perception as sort of the, the, the problem. And actually the question of the state is very interesting because when I uh, mentioned that in one of our meetings, uh, the Greece not having a functioning state, uh, uh, my friend Ivan Vevoda, uh, who I uh, uh, greatly miss here, uh, said, ah yeah, but we is different because we had Yugoslavia and Belgrade, etc. We, we had a functioning state, you know. So, you remember 20 years ago, we were discussing, oh, transition, how to shed the legacy of communism. This was transition. Now we discover that the legacy of communism, <laughs> of the communist period, there was a functioning state or something like that, and the Greeks didn't have it. So who needs a transition? The Greeks or, or the Serbs? Well, up to you to up to you decide. But the main, the main, uh, 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 the main difficulty is the reconfiguration of the EU itself. What we have now in Europe is the lesser importance of the East-West divide. Over the last 20 years, we've seen the convergence of the two parts of Europe and successful integration. That is working, the divide East-West is diminishing. The North-South divide is the one that came to the fore in this crisis. What is tearing apart Europe today, and European, the core of, the, of Europe, is the North-South divide. Uh, I don't have to spell out the detail. The Balkans find themselves at the receiving end of both, the east-west and the north-south divide. So this is one of the things that makes things difficult. And then, of course, I, I, I know I have to be brief, but if you look ahead of what can come out of this crisis, what scenarios? Well, as, as in the uh, movie, uh, the, the Sergio Leone, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, uh, uh, the good scenario, uh, 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 well, let me start with, with the ugly, because that, uh, it's always nicer to end with, with, with a more positive note. The ugly, uh, that's the one that you see at conferences, for instance, organized by, by my friend Ivan Krastev about the disintegration of Europe. You know, he had in Vienna conference on comparing breakup of EU with breakup of Soviet Union, unraveling uh, another conference where we compared breakup of EU with breakup of Yugoslavia, breakup of Habsburg Empire, etc. It's basically for long years academics have been studying in European integration, they're now very keen, some of them at least, on studying disintegration. Okay, you are familiar in this region uh, uh, about this, but basically the message is, you know, not 
uh, not Europeanizing of Balkans as the agenda, but suddenly fragmentation, Balkanization of Europe and of European states. Look at Catalonia, look at, look at uh, 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 Belgium, etc. Accountancy has become the dominant feature of European politics. We have accountants rather than political leaders. So that, that is one problem, and that affects the perception of the region, and that's the ugly scenario. That was ugly. What's, what's, what's bad? What's bad about it? No, no, the, the, that was ugly. That and was the, the ugly. The, 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 uh, the bad would be, from, from my point of view, simply muddling through. That is, Europe is, you know, ad hoc dealing business as usual, trying to fix the euro crisis, etc., and that loses the ball on the Balkans. That would be the ugly scenario because it's busy with other things. It has to remain proactive as it is now. Proactive EU engagement. This is working now in the region. If it's not doing that, look at setbacks. Look at Macedonia. Nobody talks about Macedonia. It's a country in regression country in regression. It, it had a good reputation in the 1990s because there was no violence there of significant. Now it is a country in regression. So when EU loses the ball, when the European perspective has been lost somewhere, or at least uh, uh, partially, that, that can have very negative circumstances. Okay, to conclude, the good scenario, at least uh, as I see it, is Europe reinvent itself through the current crisis that the euro becomes the federal core of the European project. That's the first circle. You have a second circle uh, uh, of the wider EU, an enlarging EU to the Balkans. Yesterday there was a British ambassador talking about Ukraine, etc. Well, you know, maybe one day in this lucid year. In <laughs> It's not always terribly convincing when the British ambassador said, I'm for Balkan enlargement, I'm from Ukraine in the EU, and guess what? Next year we're having a referendum about how to leave the EU. Anyway, uh, that was my uh, 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 little uh, ad hoc comment, uh, uh, which uh, uh, is not terribly diplomatic, I, I uh, confess. So uh, 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 that's the second circle, and the third circle being our neighbors, eastern neighbors, Ukraine and further east, Southern neighbors, don't have to spell how, how uh, 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 this region is affecting, both from East and the South, is affecting the Balkans. So uh, that Europe of concentric circles as a way of coping with the dividing lines, East, West, North, South, the concentric circles, that's the new European geometry. Uh, I don't know whether this is going to happen. You ask us to think 2020, maybe. It's good for people in the region, for political leaders, etc., to think about not just what's happening here, but what kind of Europe is shaping up and what kind of Europe they have in mind. Do they want a looser Europe, just a common market? Do they want a more federal core? Well, that would be the irony for members of former Yugoslav Federation to join a federal Europe. Well, I think I conclude with that. Thank you. The, Mr. Frattini, um, uh, uh, Mr. Rupnik has been talking about new divide, divide between the North and the South, but there's also um, talk, a lot of talk in Brussels uh, uh, about it, the other, another fault line, uh, Eurozone members, non-Eurozone members. How do you see this reconfig ongoing reconfiguration of Europe? Well, uh, uh, where is it going yeah. from your perspective? Uh, thank you very much. I, I will start uh, where uh, Mr. Rupnik uh, stopped his introductory remarks. Um, first of all, we are not talking about uh, 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 technocratic or bureaucratic scenarios. We are talking about uh, a very highly political challenge for hundreds of millions of Europeans. Uh, my first point is to uh, try to indicate very briefly how to overcome problems and obstacles that Mr. Rupnik just indicated. I uh, share uh, mainly all what he said about the existing obstacles. Well, uh, to do so, to try to overcome, to try to overcome, first of all, we need political leadership. 
is not possible just to multiply current exercises on bureaucratic proposals. Do you agree that the accountants have taken over? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, having been for four years Vice President of European Commission, I can understand from inside the European machineries that now <coughs> the time has come to take only political visionary decisions. Otherwise, these obstacles will never be overcome. The first point where political leadership are called upon is by reconnecting with the public opinion, reconnecting with those that believe that Brussels is only bureaucracy, is to explain very frankly, I would say bluntly, the cost of losing European integration. How much will it cost to lose free open market, freedom of movement, free and open borders within the European space? This, just to explain to those that used to take for granted all the achievements of Europe, that these achievements would be lost in case of collapse of Europe or setback of Europe. This is the first point because that we should talk in terms, not Europe it's a good in itself. Europe it is good because that Europe is good for citizens of Europe. Because we've been guaranteeing free market, open access to competition, freedom of movement. When you got in Serbia visa-free regime at the time, I was responsible. I saw people coming to Rome from Serbia free to move. They said, we felt Europe is close to us now, because this was a tangible message. Think about uh, Italians or Austrians or Germans losing the possibility to cross the borders without custom controls, as it was before Schengen Agreement. Is it a cost that citizens had to understand? Second point, to the future. We have been talking about uh, monetary union, and we got it. Now we are talking about uh, banking union. We will have to work about that. I remember as foreign minister of Italy when we signed in Rome in, in uh, uh, 2004 the European Constitutional Treaty. Unfortunately, this treaty w w uh, is not entered into force because the uh, referenda in two founding member states of Europe, but that constitutional treaty spoke for the first time of a figure very close to the foreign minister of Europe. It was not possible. Now the Lisbon Treaty got, I would say, more modest ambitions in 2008 and in 2009 when it entered into force. Now, if I want to overcome these obstacles, I have to have a vision and to go farther. I'm a partisan of the uh, United States of Europe. I'm a partisan of a political union. Having just an economic union, a banking union, a common market is not enough. We need a political union in terms of security, common defense, common foreign policy. When will it happen? Maybe not overnight. We will have to overcome a number, a lot of problems, but Frankly speaking, when I hear talking about the reunification of Europe as premature, as I would say source of opportunities but also problems, I'm not in agreement with that opinion. Reunification, I don't want to talk about enlargement. This is reunification. Reunification of Western Balkans started. And Croatia is another milestone. To me, the reunification of Europe is not yet finished. 
It will be finished when all the Western Balkans countries will be full members of Europe. Otherwise, if you don't have ambition, my final point, how to achieve it in political terms? This is the challenge for political leaders, starting from political families. We have a golden opportunity. The next election for the European Parliament in 2014, all the political families, but first of all, the most important political families, should have, first of all, their respective candidates for the presidency of European Commission. They will have to present to 500 or millions of Europeans, this is my candidate and this is our program. What kind of Europe do we want? And frankly speaking, otherwise, there will be no transparency. People will go to vote without knowing for what kind of vote they will vote. This is the precondition to achieve a step forward. Otherwise, there will be a vicious circle. The crisis, the enlargement or reunification fatigue, Eurosceptic parties will grow because there is no transparency in political forces, no capacity to put on the table a real program. Are you in favor of a political union, including common foreign policy and common defense policy? You have to say that before the election. This is the way to try to overcome the obstacles from now and the next 10 years. Thank you. Maybe we should go uh, back to the region now uh, and to the original uh, title of this uh, debate. Uh, in the year 2000, when uh, uh, Milosevic was kicked out of power and uh, the President Tudjman of Croatia was already departed, I remember the talk of the town here in Belgrade was that in five or six years we will probably become members. I expect the expectations in, in, in uh, Tirana were also very high after uh, Amir Hodja's regime uh, crumbled. Uh, now, 13 years later, Serbia has barely be just barely because become a candidate and will have, well, probably at least seven or eight more years before full membership. Uh, Albania has finally broken through the internal blockade and is on the way to become a candidate this year. But if somebody told me that it will take this long, uh, I would probably uh, would, not, would not believe it. Now, I want to ask uh, 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 Mr. Tadic and Mr. Svilanovic uh, and uh, Ramzi, of course, uh, what, Ramzi, what, what happened? What went wrong? Why is this taking so long? Who is to blame? Is it, is it us, uh, the Balkans? Is it the Euro shifty European Union ever stepping away from us? moving the goalposts and so on. So, Mr. Tadic, would you, would you start? I think it's better Goran Svilanovic to explain. He started earlier than I. <laughs> thank you very much, Dejan. Thank you, President Tadic, Minister Fratini, dear friends, Ramsey and Jacques. Uh, I'm actually very happy the way you started this panel. We are Europe. No less, no more than Italy. <laughs> Frankly, yes, we are. Compatible national. So we should have no, we should not have this kind of a feeling we are not or we are not yet. Yeah. Membership is a technical thing. Yeah. Socially, we are no less EU member state than Italy, Bulgaria, Romania, Greece. Look at the elections, who won, who lost. And we share all the problems they are faced with. What we've seen in case of the EU members, I mentioned and many others I've not member, mentioned, is a jobless growth. This is what we've seen in the Balkans, and I'm grateful for this phrase, which is not my invention. It's Milica Ulic, who is around, and I'm grateful. This is exactly what was happening to us. Figures were doing well, and people were leaving their jobs. They were fired. But the investments were coming. Privatization was there. In result, when the crisis hit, and it is hitting very hard, each and every country in this region and around this region, we realize what is good about these figures, mentioning accountants, 
if the people do not work, and they do not. So what is the problem? And this is what brings us together, I'd say, the new members and non-new members is, is there an intellectual offer? Some of the people around were part of the 60s and the movement in Europe, as it was in Belgrade, it was in Paris and elsewhere. But then there was an intellectual offer. There was a dream and there was a huge number of philosophers, intellectuals, writers, who really offered something, who were fighting for something. Today, in some of the new members, actually the real precondition to end up in the office is that you've never been seen on TV, ever, ever, ever. We don't want you because we know you. We'll take whoever else. I'm not sure whether the result is any better, but this is what is happening. It's basically, and I really stick to this, the people around us, as well as in this country, are demanding a new social contract. Therefore, what we have discussed, the things cannot continue the way they've been run so far. They cannot. Neither in Brussels, nor in London, or Paris, they cannot be run as they were run in any of the capitals in this region. And I think we will face this reality. Some of the countries mentioned are facing this situation, and then when they see results, I'm sorry I'm using an example of your country, but you had a guy with 19%. What do you do with this 19%? Who are these people? They're living, they want something. And they say, I want him, whoever he is. And then, if he or she ends up in the office, you don't know what to do with this. It's not a political party, the way we understand political party. And then they collapse, as it was happening in Czech Republic several, uh, several years back, and then you don't know what to do. So the voters there, living people are there, they are requesting something. And this is, for me, the key problem. I do not see an intellectual offer for the years to come. As it is happening in Europe, it is happening here. As you can see from what I was saying, I'm speaking mainly about economy because of the crisis which revealed all of the problems, structural problems in the foundation of the way we are living. And this is what actually worries me, that I do not see an offer, something, a new ideas. What do we do? How do we live? How do we respond to a crisis? And there, there I'd say, if we were wrong about the dates, and we were, I can say for myself, it was that we were thinking within the box, which was defined, Salonic Agreement, Europe, we're gonna be there one day, sooner or later, but it's a matter of a few years' time. What we have listened here, and I'm grateful to the organizers, the Belgian Fund for Political Excellence and the others who've joined in this forum, so we could have listened yesterday to a representative of the OSC, Adam Kobieratki was here. What did he tell us? And I witnessed this because I've spent four years with him there. It was a problem in Astana to recommit to what countries have committed for in 70s, in 2000, 10, 11, they don't want to recommit. No, 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 no. No, we don't want this way of the freedom of media rapporteur who would come and tell us you are bad. Out. No, 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 no. We don't want the director of ODIR who will come and tell us your elections were not in accordance with the rules. So what I'm now trying to do is to bring together the economy that I've described in these bad colors, together with our beliefs, what is usually referred at in Europe as common values. The OSC is one organization. What about the Council of Europe? The key organization which is dealing with defining the standards and monitoring the implementation. Which, but which so, doesn't have a, that No, no, I'm cloud. saying this, uh, is, this is, the problem is we have gone as individual countries several steps back when it comes to believing that we should share with each other, that we should take and respect an interest that others show about the democracy in our society. We've, we are becoming selfish, believing, no, no, no. Le just leave us, we'll deal with our economic problems. Don't ask questions about the media freedom. Don't ask questions about the other elements of the free society and open society. So it is a hugely difficult situation, I would say, in each and every country. And therefore, I won't make a difference between the EU members and non-EU members. We share the problems. What? if we discuss the difference, what the difference is, and I see is 
still the system. You were mentioning functioning state, whether we had it before, whether we have it now in the countries in the Balkans. Well, I would give a credit, of course, to the European Union as an idea and as a functioning system. Therefore, I have no problem with accountants in Brussels, but I would appreciate if we have a brave heart to go for the changes in each and every society and to pay respect to what the people are telling us and what they are telling us. They are willing to go through the changes because they have no option, but they're not sure whether we are offering anything besides the stories we've been telling them years back and promises we've been telling them years back. I'm not frightened whether Serbia will be in the EU in, in the next two rounds of elections. This is basically what you've just said. Yes. I'm not frightened from this. What I care for is whether this country will continue being brave as it was when it comes to the recent government, brave to deal with the most critical issues, which in this case is Kosovo, and then some others will come, organize crime, and then whether the society will follow and support the idea that we have to change. And it has nothing to do with EU membership. It has to do with the survival of the society as a democratic, free, open society. And then, and then, of course, we will look around and see who are the countries around and that, whether they go towards the same direction. I believe, and this is my experience during the last several months, and I'll stop here, that you will see this, um, see this emotion in every country around us when you talk to the people and when you talk to the officials. So far, we were really, we've been supported. I can say for the term in office I've spent, there was a huge support, political, emotional support coming from our EU friends and allies. Now I'm not sure because they are busy with all of these issues themselves, and this is why it is a critical moment for the leadership in every nation in the Balkans to take a responsibility and to continue the process because the process was always about the nation and state building in the Balkans. And that process has to continue. The impulse, the magnet was the EU membership. It is still strong. See what is happening in this country. See what is happening in some other countries. But then you can see the weaknesses. And Jacques had just mentioned some of the cases where you see that magnet is not strong anymore to push the government, to push the society, to go for a critical decision. You mentioned the name issue, for instance. So you have differences. And I believe that these are the issues to be discussed. And then we can see what is the offer, what the Regional Cooperation Council can do in this respect, what the government of this country can do in this respect, what the organization you are involved, what is the offer for each and every country to go through the process which I find a critical and long-lasting one. I don't know whether it will end in three years, only two years, and then we'll say there is no crisis. I think that this is a huge problem, structural, and we just being on a periphery, as it was defined, being on two receiving ends, as it was very well said, and I like this phrase, both on east and on the south, uh, but will we have enough of energy to, to really go through this? I'm encouraged by what is happening in Serbia. But we need to understand that the problem is huge, and there would be a need really to, to support those who are brave enough in their hearts to tell the truth and to be honest with the people and to offer what there is to be offered. No dreams anymore, because I may say I belong to the government which had a big dream and was offering the dreams. The time is more difficult today than it was when I was in the office, and I appreciate the fact that now <coughs> the critical energy will have to come both by the leaders and by the people who support them, uh, to, of course, keep the dream, because dream is important, but to be very realistic, brutally realistic on what we can do and how far we can go with this. Uh, Renzi, uh, you have a brand new prime minister now, your country. The, the doors of Europe are unlocked, unlo finally, as uh, Commissioner Fiala said uh, recently. Uh, for Albania, um, uh, are the Albanians still dreaming? of Europe, or has this, this uh, dream faded a yeah. bit? Actually, uh, Dejan is my second time participating in a, a kind of process of futurology, uh, Balkans or Albania 2020. First time was 
2004, I was asked by a Swiss organization to write a pessimistic and optimistic scenario of Albania in 2020. My optimistic scenario was Albania would be member of the EU and member of NATO. My pessimistic scenario was that Albania will not be nor in EU, not in NATO. It seems reali realism stays in between, and Albania is uh, made NATO member, but it's far from being a, an EU member. And you ask the question, what went wrong? You know, of course, first of all, we have to accept that a lot is achieved. I, I like that also Jacques started with a positive note, that there are a lot of things which happened and changed in this region and also in my country. But also there are a lot of failures. And in our case, uh, Albania actually was in a better position compared with, uh, with the new uh, countries uh, which uh, appeared after the dissolution of Yugoslavia because we, had, we were not part of the ethnic conflicts. We had no war legacy no bilateral dispute, no status issues. We are not an unfinished state, you know. But in the Balkans, even when you don't have any existential problems, sometimes you invent us, and this is our case. We invented the, the problem, and it was our permanent political conflict, which was the best, the worst way to lose time, and we wasted time. This is, we are victim of ourselves. We cannot blame, blame the, somebody else, neighbors. Of course, we are affected by the wars in in the region, but in a way, I think this is uh, uh, our failure. If now I have to, to dream again on 2020, of course, we are a NATO member, uh, and of course, I don't think that we are going to be a member of the EU of, in 2020 for the reasons which are related with us, but also with the reasons which are related to Europe, and that Rupnik, Mr. Rupnik explained very, very well. But what is important is to keep the promise. And accession of Croatia is a good news, because I think we need Europe also as a Eurotopia, as a station where we are traveling. Without that, yeah, I, without that, I think we will be drawn in a kind of Balkan, Balkan, Balkan waters not of conflicts, because I think that things are, has reached a point of irreversibility. I believe that Balkans is not anymore an unpredictable region. It's actually too predictable. What I am afraid is what I call the tyranny of the status quo. We might have a very long-term status quo with some zigzags, which is the case of Macedonia, for example. So, in the case of Albania, of course, I think uh, there are hopes that the uh, that, uh, country will get the candidate status, but the, the road is still, uh, still long. Uh, I believe that the message in December will be important uh, because you can find the reasons to exclude us again. Huh? Let's be realistic. But country needs to have a message because then if you do three laws and you don't do the three laws, if you have good elections and you have bad elections, it's the same story, then this would be a wrong message to, to the public. And by the way, based on a Gallup, uh, Gallup uh, 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 survey, uh, in Albania the number of people who believe in Europe are higher than the number of people who believe in God. So, uh, I think the there European... Was a survey in Kosovo, just yeah, the some European, years ago, the where European, the number of people who believed in NATO was a bit larger than the number of it's people... Also the same, uh, no? it's, it's also the same. So it's important to, to keep the promise, to keep the, the door open. Uh, what is good now in the Balkans is that we are... We, as I said, it's predictable. We know where we are traveling. We don't know the speed which we are traveling. We'd like to see a process of acceleration, but uh, I, I am not naive. I don't think that we'll see an acceleration of the process. We'll see, uh, you know, wait and see and step-by-step -step approach. But uh, if the door is opened, I am fine with that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tadic, uh, you've been touring uh, 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 capitals of Europe uh, since uh, you went out of the presidential office. What have you learned since since you left your position as president of Serbia? 
in the meantime. We have a problem to hear well I'm because sorry. of echo. Which is okay. uh, first, uh, I didn't, I didn't hear well. We didn't hear well. Uh, how many people are believing in Europe, in Albania, and how many people in God? Eighty-eight and sixty-six in Europe. Eighty-eight in Europe and only sixty-six on God. Okay, <laughs> that's bad for the God, but still <laughs> good for Europe. <laughs> Maybe they should start building shrines. Uh, uh, Serbia. No. This is not cases in Serbia. So, uh, uh, should I repeat the question? Yes, please. Uh, I said you've been touring uh, uh, European capitals uh, for the past uh, year. You come often to Brussels, you come to other, other places. You've been talking to a lot of important people. What have you learned since you left presidential office about European integration of Serbia? Or have you? Well, uh, this is a quite obvious that Europe is uh, facing with, uh, with uh, uh, s very specific problems. And uh, Mr. Rupnik and Franco Frattini has been trying to explain uh, that kind of difficulties. Uh, and what I learned after being in office uh, is that uh, European politicians are not taking real leadership in their hands and uh, Many of them are thinking about elections, not about solving the critical problems Europe is facing with. Without solving that problems, uh, neither European Union current countries nor uh, applicant countries can be very happy in the next six years. We are talking about Balkans and the European perspective in the next six years, in, in, to, in 2020. Uh, I agree with the Franco that leadership is very important. And uh, Goran has been mentioning also that interesting phenomena. But this is not enough. Uh, I'm talking right now about uh, European philosophy, the way of thinking, system of values. I'm, thinking, I'm talking about vision and perspective. And now, if you are talking with, with the European Union politicians and leaders, uh, you cannot say that in the next two or three years we'll have a more Europe within Europe than today. Uh, is Europe going to be capable to, to deal with that challenges? I don't know exactly. But we have to be optimistic and we have to work on that because there is no alternative. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is no alternative. What is alternative? to European Union, to enlargement process, to enhancing capabilities of Europe to be more competitive on the global market in the future, is that uh, fragmentation of Europe, balkanization of Europe, which was mentioned by Mr. Rupnik. On the beginning of my term, I was trying to explain simply to ordinary people that we have to have a debalkanization of Balkans, some kind of Scandinavization of Balkans, uh, which means a reconciliation process to be more rational, to solve chronic problems we are facing with, to be focused on concrete issues that are coming, that are threatening to us, to s destroy even very vulnerable economy we have for years, for decades. But now we see Europe is facing with similar problems. Not that kind of problems we've been facing with, but also similar problems. European politicians are waiting elections to be capable to solve problems. But elections are coming every year. After elections in Germany, next year we are going to have uh, elections for European Parliament. After that elections, we are going to have other elections. Uh, even some countries are passing through elections, they cannot solve problem in forming government. Look at Italy right now. Italy is in a better shape right now, but that was a big problem in the past few months. We talked, Franco and I, before the, this conference. Uh, and we have to be very focused on solving that chronical and that critical problems. Now we are coming to the countries that are applicants, Balkan countries. 
But I, I do not want to talk only, only about Balkans. I would like to talk about uh, Eastern countries, uh, about geostrategy, uh, about uh, what is real European goal in the next 20, next 30 years. Uh, there is no empty space, even in uh, biological cells. There is no empty space. If Europe is not existing on the Balkans, in Ukraine, in South Caucasus, some other players are going to come there. There are many aspirants. And this is a real, very serious problem for European Union countries today. If Europe is not going to finish enlargement process, Europe is going to be weaker in the next 20, 30 years. How we can imagine uh, single markets, German markets, can be competitive on the global market in the next 30 years with the 80 million people? Not 80 million in the next 20 years, less than 80 million because of bird rate in Germany. How France can be competitive in that respect? Italy, no way. With the China, with India, okay. With the BRIC countries, with the ASEAN country, countries, with the United States, this is, this is not possible. This is simply not possible. If we don't have a wider perspective, big vision in our mind, every problem we are trying to solve right now is not going to be solvable. And uh, this is why I'm putting in that context enlargement process on the Balkans and Eastern partnership with Ukraine and other countries. On the other hand, Balkan countries, if we are entering into the EU earlier than we are capable to solve our problems, we'll pay extremely high price. I am not in favor of that kind of perspective. This is why we are not sh asking for shortcuts. We are asking for a normal period to implement reforms. And right now, for us, what we have to do is uh, extremely important to implement reforms. This is a vital issue, to implement reforms, to, to be prepared for full membership, really. Not to get a, only data for accession talks and to be very happy for that. To be prepared to implement reforms. The other side of that process is what Europe is, uh, for example, I'm using Serbian case, Serbian example in order to explain wider perspective for other Balkan countries. Well, right now we, are, we, are, we can hear that in the European Union there is an uh, initiative made by uh, Germany and uh, Great Britain uh, in terms of negotiation process with Serbia, chapter 35, uh, the famous chapter 35. This is a Kosovo issue. Even though we have a Brussels agreement, that Kosovo issue is going to exist as a focal point during the negotiation process. It's uh, very difficult. I totally agree that Serbia cannot bring the new problem and conflict into the European Union. But the European Union has to be very flexible in that respect. Because we have to have in Serbia support of the Serbian ordinary people regarding enlargement process. If we have an unflexible European Union approach to that issue, Serbian government will be in a very difficult situation. Now I'm not president of Serbia. I am not an uh, active politician in internal Serbian politics, but I am advocate of my country in that respect. This is very, very important. Uh, what, what, what I, uh, what, what I learned... First day, he said he was talking about this danger that Kosovo issue is going to overshadow all the other issues. Uh, 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 over Serbia's accession process, uh, including the reforms. And I have to tell you that I tend to share this fear. Because, uh, about a year ago, I remember I was trying to do a story about uh, what does Brussels think about uh, judiciary reforms. 
in Serbia. I requested, because there were some mixed signals coming, and I want to clear that up, I requested, finally met some experts, from several of them from the commission, legal experts, and they were talking for about half an hour, but I couldn't get a clear answer. Are the reforms going anywhere, or they're bad, or they should be restarted? So I interrupted and said, can you please tell me, you know, works, doesn't work, should, should work better, just give me a simple answer that my readers can understand. And they said, okay, yeah, just be cooperative on Kosovo, everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it, is, it, 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 it is definitely a, a real danger, but I would like to ask you just one more question before I open the, 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 the floor to the public. Uh, if there's one thing that, that is absolutely doubtless as, as, as your legacy uh, is the, you have worked during your presidency very hard on regional uh, co uh, uh, cooperation and reconciliation. Uh, Not only this, regional, but internal reconciliation among internal the Serbian political regional. parties to, to create national consensus on European agenda. Yes. And once In 2008, that was totally impossible to imagine. Now we have a national consensus on European agenda. This is very important. And the relations are generally much, much better now, uh, and I think even trust between the, 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 the Balkan nations. Uh, but when the, the European uh, crisis began several years ago, and as it uh, unfolded, I was astonished by how, how quickly some of the old postulates of Europe, um, um, the, the, the founding principles, uh, and even decency started to disappear once the money was starting to, suddenly you could hear race, openly racist statements this north and south demand, suddenly we don't want to pay for lazy Greeks, we don't want to, the whole, uh, two, two days ago, then, then Angela Merkel declared multiculturalism dead a couple of years ago, maybe it was a mistake, I'm not sure. Two days ago, the Dutch foreign minister said, uh, the Dutch king, the Dutch king uh, said, uh, no more welfare state, this has to be dismantled. It's very strange coming from a guy who's actually living on welfare. Uh, but anyway, this started uh, disappearing much sooner than one would expect after 50, and some of the old, old divides which were thought to be forgotten started springing up like jack in a box. The question I'm going to ask you, and I would like uh, Goran to pitch in uh, also because you have a very good viewpoint from Sarajevo, is do you think that this progress in reconciliation and, and establishing neighborly relations in the Balkans are, uh, have reached the point where they have become irreversible or once the crisis starts biting even harder, we'll, we can retreat, relapse into bad, bad old days again. My, in my view, we are living in a different world after Lehman. Uh, we have a Europe and the world before Lehman and after Lehman. After Lehman, uh, we have a new era of uh, challenges within European Union, and that is why the, some kings and the politicians are launching that kind of ideas very often. Uh, after Lehman, even reconciliation process is uh, even harder. In, a, in the worst economic uh, conditions, it's really very difficult to find solutions for problems we've been facing during the 1990s. If you're asking me, is it, is it possible to turn back in 1990s? This is always possible. This is unfortunately always possible. But we, we have to be very careful. From that reason, we have to keep healthy idea of European Union. From that reason, we're expecting European Union politicians to be uh, more responsible in finding solutions for their own problems. What about role of central bank? What about European Union? I, I agree with uh, Franco Frattini. This is, from my point of view, only solution we have in the long-term perspective. In that, ca in, that, in that sense, if, if we are taking that perspective for European Union, we have to hope that European politicians will be, we are, go are going to be capable to solve their own problems. We have to do our homework to implement very fast and uh, quite good reforms. Otherwise, in the period six, year, six years from now, we are not going to be capable to enter the European Union. And uh, everyone has to work on its own homework right now. And what we have to have in the mind this is a wider perspective in the next 20 years, 30 years, not 
only about 2020. Are we going to be capable to be competitive on the global market with the BRIC countries, with the ASEAN countries, maybe with the United States? Right now I'm traveling with a, with a mission of the uh, Party of European Socialists in, in Washington, uh, and we are going to talk about that trade union zone between United States and European Union. This is an interesting project, from my point of view, uh, really strategically extremely important. But that is what we have to have in our minds. This is how I see current situation. Goran, uh, would you pitch in about this? I will. Uh, you ask actually about the reconciliation yes. efforts in the region during the last more than 10 years and the results yes. at this point. Uh, but uh, what I've learned in Sarajevo is what the people who've been suffering and are victims of the war crimes, attempted genocide in Srebrenica, what they're crying for is let's agree that this had happened. Just Stop for a while reconciliation. We'll love each other later on, but let's agree on the facts. This is the cry. And I have a feeling that what they are telling me is we have not yet agreed on every detail. How did this happen? What exactly happened? Who did what? And they are open to discuss these details. So uh, what I'm saying actually is in, in a way indirectly I'm referring to the ICTY and the results of the proceedings. In a way, uh, this is perhaps on the human. We just want to forget because whoever we are. Because is probably one of the most researched war crimes ever. It yeah, has been. Uh, is and, every and detail if, if, known if in So many years society. later, we still have a problem uh, yeah, exactly. uh, with the facts. It, it is a big this is, problem. Uh, thank you very much for saying this. It's not that these facts are not known generally, but it is right that these facts are not shared so that we learn whether we live in Belgrade or in Banja Luka or in Zagreb or in every place around in the region that we know whether we are 20 or 50 that we have learned on what has happened. So this is exactly what you're saying and thank you very much. So this is not that it is not known, it is not shared and somehow we need to inherit to accept the facts. And then, yes, it is right. When it comes to readiness to go further together, it exists and it's uh, absolutely, uh, you can see in whoever you talk in the region, they realize we are small. And I think that was what President Tadic was saying. We are small countries, small nations. In order to really make it functional economically, we need to work with each other. We need to reorganize. And this is why this big dream about becoming the EU member states is vivid and is relevant. We will be in the EU, but the EU will be very much different, and by the time we are there, we will change a lot on every level of the societies in the Balkans. So this is my key message. But we have to live this change. On the reconciliation, uh, I think that we need to work more so that we educate people. So the generation that comes, my children and their children, they will have to learn on the process which led us into a crime and the consequences of this. Otherwise, yes, of course, there is a huge readiness to work with each other. This is why there are these new initiatives, how we can shape the Balkans together. Uh, the most recent one was discussed yesterday here with different commands, where we can have a group of uh, six from the region together with uh, Slovenia and Croatia in somehow functioning better, particularly when it comes to economy, investments, what we can do with this. But these details are to be discussed further because uh, next week there are going to be two different uh, informal meetings of ministers. One of the format I'm just explaining, 6 plus 2, and Commissioner Phil and myself will be there. Another one will be run by Romania, and this is called Southeast European Cooperation Process, which adds to this number of people also Moldova, Greece, Turkey, Romania, Bulgaria, so the wider Balkans. Both meetings are going to be very important because we are going to discuss real life issues, this is, this is, not philosophy the circles that, that I've that started the, with, yes. but the economy and how we can do more. Uh, what we've done in the Regional Cooperation Council, we have designed this Southeast U Europe 2020 strategy. It's all about economy. So basically, my direct answer to your question would be the RCC is moving from peace and stability and reconciliation into economy. 
It's the economy stupid, as they say. Exactly. Right? Okay, I'd like to open the floor for discussions. By now you all know the rules, so please state your name uh, uh, and or organization that you will. Let's take first three questions. Uh, I have a little bit of uh, light uh, shining, but I don't see any hands raised. Oh my God, so uh, you all want to wrap it up. At, oh, so yes, gentlemen. Thank you very much. My name is Andrei Matyshaga. I'm from Slovakia, from Devi Pravda. And uh, I would like to ask, more or less, uh, especially the panelists from the, from the Balkans, but anybody who want to, who want to comment on this, uh, please do. So, uh, uh, Mr. Fratini just said something about the political union and how we should move towards the political union, if I am correct. Uh, so, uh, let's say that we will have a fully, full, fully political union in the, in the, within the EU with, uh, without national governments, without national elections. Uh, so, would you be, uh, could, can, you, can you possible that you would enter the club like this? Thank you. You know, no, uh, the no. full, the, no, political union, how, how would you define political union? If you, went, if you want to have a fully integrated political union, then why, why have a national governments? Why, have a, why to have a national, national, national elections? Let's have a European parliament. Because we have uh, different identities. Yeah. And uh, within that uh, vision of uh, more united Europe, we have to protect different identities. Yes, I, I think different identities are enrichment for the uh, United States of Europe, as I like to define the long-term future of Europe. It doesn't mean to uh, cancel, to uh, abolish the idea of national state. I made just two examples, common foreign policy and defense and security common European policies. If Europe wants to be a global player, how is it possible when it comes to a quite important decision on whether to uh, recognize to the Palestinian Authority a given status? We have three different positions, those that are in favor, those that are against, those that abstain. And the same applied recently to the decision to supply arms to the rebels in Syria. These are two recent examples. What I mean is to try to build a new system where while keeping, of course, national and I would add local identities, Italy is uh, uh, founded, is based on multicultural and multi-traditional experiences from the south to the north of Italy. How can I uh, 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 give up that tradition? But it means counting, being a global player. How can I negotiate with China on the role on the nuclear disarmament if we are divided from within as Europeans? This is my idea of a, 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 a political union, nothing to do with, uh, I would say, overcoming this uh, idea itself of national states. That's nothing to do with that. <laughs> Why not? Well, because, uh, because, <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. well, it's, it's, it's it, the, the governments, what, what the governments have to do with, with our identity? Cannot keep our identities be, and have a co the, the, the common election for European Parliament? Do we really need state governments? Well, I, 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 I give you an anecdote. Once uh, one of my former colleagues, a foreign minister of a given state, said there will be uh, the federal Europe, the uh, Europe with no national states, when a joke told from a Cypriot will be making smiling a Finnish. 
Please. I can hear you, but I'm not sure about the others. So. Uh, my name is Elica Minic. I worked for five years for the Regional Cooperation Council in Sarajevo. And uh, listening to you, uh, the concept of politics, only top down. Uh, are politicians, missionaries inventing the world? Or they are tapping opportunities, they are understanding trends in the society, they are watching uh, autonomous initiatives of different social groups, following what is going on in economics, correcting. So uh, it's a bit old fashioned approach to politics watching in the RCC how many authentic initiatives are going on in the region and connecting the region with Europe, uh, it's a bit different approach to uh, articulating uh, political decisions and devising visions. So I'm a bit, uh, a bit disappointed with this approach to politics, excluding many social groups from political processes. Uh, all of you. I didn't hear that approach. No. Well, that was my understanding. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe. I do apologize. <laughs> I try to answer to this and be very honest, very direct. And uh, tell it I was a member of the government, to be very precise, of a group of five people who have decided that Milosevic will have to go to The Hague. In one meeting, which lasted 45 minutes, there were five people in a room. When do you think this society would bring this decision if asked to say yes in relevant numbers? I'll go on. This government in Serbia has made, through a very difficult, complex process, uh, a deal called Brussels Agreement. When do you think this society, in relevant numbers, would vote for this if really challenged to say yes or no. If it was not for those who I see as the leaders, who said, I take a responsibility, political, I'll pay with my career, but I understand that it is my responsibility, this is why I was voted in, to bring the change to this society and pay a political price. So I gave you two different examples. There is 10 years span. And I'm not sure whether each of these decisions, including the first one, would be supported. So what I'm saying, I apologize. I tried to give an example in my first several minutes of these emotions coming from the people. This is why I mentioned several countries and what is happening there. And I mentioned the new social contract as a request, as a demand. And I feel it's all around. It is and that there is somehow an inability of the political elite to respond to this, not in one country, but in the countries we are having in mind here. That's one situation, so I'm aware of this happening, particularly when you use the new media, that people are, they are thinking about the future, they want something different, and they're requesting. And I've said there is no intellectual offer, unfortunately. But on the other hand, when it comes to critical political decisions, a leadership is needed. And you do it or you don't do it. And you step out of the office and walk high or you just vanish. That's life in politics. Biljana uh, Dakić, Georgievich, Balkan Trust for Democracy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Svilanovic. You just stepped into the question I wanted to ask and actually quote when you said that people in Europe and in the Balkans are demanding a new social contract and there are no new ideas, no new offers. But it seems to me that some of the new ideas and political offers uh, in Europe and in the Balkans have been there for some time, but there seems to be increasingly populist, increasingly right-wing, increasingly national, increasingly provincial. Um, you said we need a leadership, we need new ideas, but how to do it? This is the question for the whole panel. Thank you. Well, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can say a word on that, because uh, I, I said, yes, we need leadership, but uh, how? Uh, I said exact, exactly the 
opposite of what uh, you, madam, said about the top-down approach. I said leadership means being transparent and giving ordinary voters, each and every voter, the right and the possibility to choose. I said I would like very much direct election of the next president of European Commission. I would like very much political families presenting transparently different options, exactly to avoid top-down approach to the idea of Europe, instead of a bottom-up approach where citizens of Europe will choose the best model for Europe. In this spirit, leadership is, I would say, has to be implemented by explaining to the public opinion what are the costs of making a choice and what are the advantages. Unfortunately, populists are, uh, I would say, spreading all around Europe because it's a very easy message to say no to, I would say, more integration, no to more solidarity, no to reunification and Western Balkans enlargement. It's very easy because uh, you touch upon some egoistic interest. The leader is the one who explains that in that case, if you choose that way, you will be paying heavier price because uh, you will be losing common market, freedom of movement, democracy, common vision. Uh, interest and common values are the drivers, but the leaders are those that are capable to explain by connecting to the citizen. This is how we can achieve. Thank you. There's a lady, Yelts. Yes. Before you go, Frontex Studies, well, my question has been partially answered, but it's uh, directed directly to Mr. Tadic. You mentioned that the EU at the moment lacks leadership. Uh, would you agree that an average pro-EU voter in Serbia can say the same, not only under this under administration, but also under your administration? Uh, my question is, uh, if you could turn back time, would you do anything differently? And the reason I'm asking that question is that it just occurred to me that in this very room a few years ago, you promoted your famous four points plan for Kosovo. And I still remember that at that moment, several people rushed out to report good breaking news, and then nothing happened with this, with this uh, proposal that you outlined, which was very well received. Would you do anything differently this time? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the short answer. <laughs> Crystal clear. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll, maybe we'll have to wait for a little bit for this analysis. But, but stop. I, I mean, uh, Yelena, of course, that uh, every leader, every president, and the prime minister is facing facing with the real challenges. I mean, I'm trying to explain uh, the role of the human beings that are leaders. You have to be decision maker. And that, t that moment is a coming. You have a 50, maybe 51% reasons to take that option or to avoid that option. But it's very difficult in the main decisions to estimate what is going to be final outcome, not only next year, but also in the next 20 years. If we, you are not taking that into the consideration, you are not responsible man, and you are not leader. I mean, ordinary people are going to say, who cares about 20 years? We need uh, benefits now. And I understand that perfectly, but that is a problem of politics. And many people that are analyzing politics from, from outside and from institutes are not taking into the consideration that challenges leaders are facing with. Uh, but democracy is not about leaders. Democracy is about ideas. 
and the will of the cit citizens. But at the same time, if leaders are only following what ordinary people are expecting, what about their own future? Leaders have to take into the consideration what is a better for ordinary people and to take responsibility for that from time to time. That is democracy also. I believe there was a question here and then Hello, everybody. My best regards to panelists, and thank you, Dan. I'm Natasha Milovic, coming from Fund for Social and Democratic Initiatives. Just a short remark, if I am allowed, and then the question which I am willingly addressing to Mr. Rupnik. If it's short, it will be allowed. Yes, it is short. Um, talking about Agenda 2020, uh, today, and not only today, in past year, actually, RCC was creating and designing Agenda 2020 for the Balkans. But the European Union has been designing that since Agenda 2010 has failed, or I'm wrong. Uh, nobody is, uh, um, or I, I do not know that somebody in the European Union has launched the report on uh, successes or failure of Agenda 2010. My question, which is addressing to Mr. Rupnik, as a researcher, and the head of a research organization or institution. Do you have a feeling or, let's say, uh, a positive experience with the acting politicians that they are willingly follow intellectuals and academic findings or they do not care at all? My question actually is how much, how much academics, intellectuals, researchers, whether they are independent you know what I mean, follow some instructions, if not some very concrete agenda and very concrete um, rules for coming period. Thank you. And maybe we could have uh, the, the second question immediately later to just to save time. Thank you. My name is Jan Sveinar. I'm from Columbia University, where I'm professor and director of the Center on Global Economic Governance, and I also work in Prague, Czech Republic. Let me follow up on your ideas about leadership, because I do agree with you that uh, we have a crisis of leadership in Europe, maybe broader than that. So I think an interesting question is, can the current people in positions of power turn into leaders, and if so, under what circumstances? Or is there another group in the offing that are leaders? If so, who are they? And when will they come into power? Right? And um, it would be optimal, in my view, if Europe could continue further with integration, speaking of economics, be it with uh, the banking union, fiscal coordination, and so on. And if so, then who are the leaders and under what circumstances they will deliver that. But I think it's also interesting to ask the opposite question, which was echoed briefly here. Suppose uh, Europe cannot go further. I submit that it's very difficult for it to stay in the current status. It's very unstable. Financial markets will attack again if they see the weakness that there is. And if so, there will be leadership needed for the deconstruction of Europe as it presently stands. Right? We can imagine a situation which would be unfortunate, but let's say not so bad, where it goes back to free trade and free labor mobility. But it could also go back where it goes into protectionism within individual states, with the nationalism and so on that was mentioned. And it would shrink dramatically. Right? I submit that Europe is at a crossroads. It's the largest economic bloc in the world still. But it could actually go down and become very fragmented, balkanized, and uh, you know, have a very hard time coming back, wiping out 50, 60 Excuse years. Me, is there a question of, somewhere yeah, there? The question <laughs> is, who are the leaders? Is it you or others in power? Is it a different group that you can identify? What will they do and under what circumstances is not the current circumstances? And can they face the task of deconstructing? 
Well, let's start with the easy one. Uh, Mr. Rupni, who are your masters? Who are, you take, who are giving orders to you? <laughs> Who's giving orders to you? <laughs> yeah, who, who is... Uh, who, no, the, the great advantage of being a free-floating intellectual is that uh, you are uh, independent. Some, uh, you ask, you know, uh, do, uh, do people in power, do they listen to you? Well, the, the general answer is uh, not, not really. Except, except, there are exceptional circumstances where that can happen. It happened a few times. When I was with Václav Havel in the first period after he came to power, that was a unique period because you have somebody who is a strong leader, very charismatic, very important, but yet inexperienced and who is not a professional politician and who is prepared to listen. And there you have, there you have exceptional circumstances where, you know, uh, intellectuals can make a difference. Where intellectuals make a difference is not necessarily in advising the powers that be. That can happen, but as I say, not very influential. Politicians usually make up their minds on different grounds. Is in influencing public debate. And what we need in Europe today is a genuine trans-European debate about the issues, including those that we have discussed here. That includes the civil society. Somebody said there was, we didn't talk enough about civil society. Well, you know, uh, 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 preparing for European elections or preparing actually for any elections uh, means having a public debate about where we're heading as Europeans. And of course, in that case, public intellectuals can have a role in trying to shape uh, 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 what is the uh, public sphere, the, the way in which... So that, that is the role of, uh, of, uh, of intellectuals. You ask, you know, is, has the uh, 2010 agenda been fulfilled? Uh, no. Uh, uh, therefore, should we pay attention to 2020 agenda? Yes. <laughs> because the agendas are always... This is a target, the goal you're aiming. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I've studied a lot the old uh, uh, socialist regimes in Eastern Europe. They all had planning. Everything was perfectly planned, and they knew where they were heading, and they were heading nowhere. Uh, it is good, instead of planning, to have target. You have a goal, and you have an agenda you try to follow. Usually, you don't manage to uh, succeed, but it, it is a way for you to force you to think uh, long term, as we have said. Politicians, you know, because of elections, uh, uh, have to think in, in short term. So this is what the agenda uh, is for, and that includes uh, uh, the enlargement uh, to the EU. Finally, on, on leadership, just one word. We crucially need European leadership if we have to do the kind of transformation that Europe needs today. Um, you know, when I mentioned federalism as a shortcut, because if you have a common currency, if you have a common kitty, and you have a convergent budget policy, convergent fiscal policy, and all that, you're talking about poli political, uh, sharing political sovereignty as well. It's not just a technical financial matter. Well, therefore, you have to become much more explicit, politically explicit, to have this understood by the population. We had first the founding fathers. They were great visionaries. They were great leaders. But they understood that if they proclaimed the federal goal of Europe in 1948, not many people would follow. You know, they had a Congress in The Hague. That was a wonderful moment. But how many? You know? So you start by doing sort of what I would call rampant federal. You, know, you do something. You create interdependence. You build the European project with that federal goal. But you're not always explicit about it. Comes the crisis, the financial crisis. Merkel and Sarkozy, so-called Merkozy, none of them is interested in the federal ID. They respond ad hoc to situations, but they create at each step in solving the crisis what I would call inadvertent federalism. You know, the each step pushes them in a direction which, <laughs> in fact, entails a kind of political Europe. Well, now we are in a phase where we cannot any longer dodge the issue. We need to make a very clear, very explicit choice to Europeans, uh, and that's why we need leadership. Uh, 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 and that's, uh, uh, we need public debate with civil society, yes, and at the end of the day, we need leaders which will clearly formulate the choice, because it will not happen on its own. You know, people think, you know, the spillover method, one thing leads to the next, that is no longer automatically working. We need political choice. Uh, Ramsey, uh, Ramsey, you wanted to say something. It would be good also to see the other side, leadership in our region. 
And actually here we come to the nature of our democracies, which we basically are illiberal democracies, strong leaders and weak institutions. And these strong leaders, they are not really showing leadership because they are not, they are not being able to take hard decisions which might cause them elections. They are running our countries by polls, not by goals, actually. So it's easy to blame for the leadership in Europe, but uh, what about our leadership? And uh, what happened in Albania also show the crisis of the leadership. The, the, the huge uh, vote of protest was also the, a vote of protest against the leadership running the country for a long time. Anybody else? Okay. Um. Uh, so we have time for one final question, uh, the gentleman in the back. I, I'm sorry, I can't see because of the light. I don't see faces, just okay, silhouettes. No, no problem, I see you. Uh, my name is Lothar Altmann from Munich, Germany and from Bucharest University. Uh, my question concerns your first question to the panel, uh, which was how will the EU look like in 2020? And so I would ask uh, Jacques Grupnik and also, also Mr. Fratini, whether, first of all, uh, further integration will happen. If it does not happen, or let us say, if it happens, can it be that uh, concerning this divide between the North and the South, that there will be uh, a further fragmentation within the existing EU? Uh, Jacques spoke only about different circles, the EU and then the accession countries and the East. But within the EU, is there the possibility or the fear that clubs within the club will, will appear? We have already this situation. Some countries have the euro, others not. Some countries will never take the euro, like Great Britain or, or Czechia. Uh, we have opt-outs forever. So can this be, become even more, let's say, dangerous for the EU? And what would that mean for the Balkan countries, for the um, applying countries. For example, if integration will not uh, proceed in the next couple of years, will that make it easier for the Balkan countries to become members? Um, and a short question to Goran, Goran uh, Svilanovic, concerning the um, regional cooperation. We had a panel here at this conference and the outcome was rather skeptical and, and not so positive. Could you give us two or three examples of substantial, really happening regional cooperation? Because you said there is the willing in, in this uh, region. So, so far, the impression is not much has happened. Can you give us some positive examples? Okay, Mr. Rupnik first. In the yes, well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fratini will, uh, will, uh, will, will, of course, give uh, uh, the uh, longer version. My, my, my short uh, take on, on, on the question you pose is, uh, uh, is this concentric circles model or multi-speed Europe, is it such a bad thing? No. I think, you know, if Europe is to expand, you know, to have what? With the Balkans, 35 countries. Yesterday, somebody spoke, Ukraine, you know, you want... If you want enlargement, and the idea that you will have a Europe of 40 countries, something like that, and you will have it uh, uh, as a coherent political model, I don't, I think that is very difficult to achieve. What Euro does, the countries that choose to have a common currency, they choose much more than a currency. As I said, they choose really to share political. This is shared sovereignty. Somebody said, you know, what about should we abolish our governments? No. We have local elections, regional elections, we have uh, uh, our national elections, but in Euro we have shared sovereignty. We share that sovereignty. So this is called multi-level governance. You have multi-level democracy. Uh, the illusion that a nation state on its own can function and be sovereign, etc., is today a limited uh, proposition. So in the Euro we should have that shared sovereignty. Not all EU countries will want that. And the, the only uh, 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 question therefore for the Balkans will be what kind of Europe do they want to join? Would they want to join the, uh, the core, the more demanding, uh, 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 if you want, degree of integration? Or uh, is it more 
plausible for future enlargement to have this second circle, which would be a more flexible, less demanding, therefore more open to enlargement, and perhaps more open to countries like Britain, who will find it more con congenial, less constraining uh, than today. So I think that this may be a compromise uh, to accept diversity in the union, have, provided there is a core well, around We find ourselves in the same club as Great Britain uh, and Ukraine well, in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> one thing is very clear to me. Uh, I cannot imagine the idea of European Union a la carte in the sense that each and every state decides what kind of euro to take and what kind of euro to leave. In this spirit, I can perfectly understand the idea of Professor Rubnik. Uh, there is already an experience which is a eurozone. There is another experience which is a Schengen area where a number of member states of Europe decided to go farther, but to go farther, uh, granting the common basis, not withdrawing from this or that or that. Uh, my idea is that idea of going farther should be kept. The Treaty of Lisbon keeps the idea, talking about enhanced cooperation. Nine or more member states can decide to go farther. One thing is clear, for those that had decided to go farther in sharing economic governance, having a common currency, having a common bank, how is it possible not have a common fiscal policy and a common economic governance? This is why I believe uh, once a given decision is taken, we have to go farther, not set back. My second remark on this very region, I think one uh, basis, I'm, I'm talking about the reunification. There are some uh, preconditions to have Western Balkans in as full member of Europe. All the countries, I said, uh, reunification will finish when all the countries will be in, but the precondition is not only sharing our common values, for example, rights of minorities, is a consolidated right in a European Union. It should be normal to see the protection of minority rights in all the countries of this region. Yeah, I understand perfectly there is a debate on protection of minority rights here in Serbia concerning uh, homosexual rights, it is absolutely normal to guarantee freedom, complete freedom in these cases. The second example, these are common values, but, the, but there are also common opportunities, a common market. Uh, uh, Boris mentioned the uh, negotiations between EU and United States on having a transatlantic free trade common space. How is it possible to exclude Western Balkans from the perspective of joining such as extremely important common market, given the fact that Western Balkans are at the crossroads of all the trans-European infrastructures, including energy infrastructures, and you, the countries in Western Balkans, represent a market open to the Asian countries that are extremely important. So these are all what is a uh, common interest. My idea is the accession is not a gift given from Brussels to your countries. It's the result of reforms being implemented and common interests that lead the leaders of this country and the leaders of Europe. Otherwise, we have the wrong idea that what you are reforming here is for the sake of Brussels. No, it's for the good of Serbians, not because uh, he's good for Brussels. He's absolutely necessary for Serbia. This has been repeated very, very often. Uh, yes, but, just uh, had, but it sometimes, somehow uh, it just does not uh, hit the, the, the target because people uh, uh, still uh, tend to believe that 
to, and the politicians to use Brussels as a sort of a scarecrow. But Goran, uh, can you yeah. can you? Franz Lothar, let me try to give you a direct answer to what you were asking. Uh, I'll start with CEFTA. You may say it was the EU-driven effort to bring the countries around the trade agreement, but I'd say that we were together there. I would add uh, energy community. There is more to be done, particularly when it comes to energy, to bring the countries together. But I think the work they're doing is already huge, and I highly appreciate. And it's also, again, the big thing driven by the EU, but it brought the countries together. Then I go to a smaller things that you uh, are aware as anybody else, but I'd like to mention them. Well, only a few days back, uh, there was an award awarded to the Center for Democracy and Reconciliation in Southeast Europe for the history books they've done. I think most of us around are familiar with. And this was really indigenous. It, it was really civil society saying, look, guys, let's bring the historians from the region and try to work on common understanding what was really happening in different parts of our joint history and overcome the differences that exist if you read the national literature in this respect. It's a huge success. And I think that they deserve to be mentioned. I'm very happy to be able to mention that they've been recently awarded. Because this is one of these big things that, that they've started smaller and now big. Of course, we should now do the critical thing and make this, these books part of the uh, regular literature in the schools. At this moment, this is not the case. This is the huge step to do, but it's already a real result. And then I'd mention something which maybe not too many people around are aware, and the Regional Cooperation Council is working on this uh, very hard. In setting it, there is what we call this uh, Legacy of the Stability Pact uh, Task Force for Culture. Uh, it brings together different ideas related to cultural cooperation in the region, and only recently they've agreed uh, for the six monuments that they'll be working on. So it's not each country, it's not each nation, but they've agreed this is what we care for together, and let's try to make a memory on these six points. And I think this is a huge result already. So uh, I can add what we are working on at this point, and this leads me to the question which was raised, and I would like to conclude by answering this question, and this is what Europe I'd love my country, Serbia, to get into. Uh, what we are working on now is the regional uh, warrant so that if you issue a warrant in Slovenia or in Croatia or in Sarajevo, it will be implemented here or in any country in the region with no further questions raised. So this is what we are working on, and I hope we will complete this. Also related to asset recovery, because organized crime is all around us and very much interlinked, as we very well know, in the countries. They do not respect borders. This is why we need to be able, if we are dealing with one of the big guys that and we go for asset recovery that it can be implemented in any country around because usually they do have assets, not only this, but in the countries around. And why did I say this brings me to my last point? The Europe I'd love my country to get into it will be the union of countries which highly respect the foundation which is embedded in the basic documents related to human rights. I was speaking today only on about economy, or mostly about economy, and I care for it. I think this is the moment we need to discuss. But we should never forget that the bases are actually related to a big dream, which was not shared only by the EU members, but also by these countries, and we are part of this culture. I care for what is in the most important documents related to human rights. Thank you very much for mentioning uh, the way the different minority uh, populations are treated, including the LGBT population. Is this is the EU I'd rights? love to see my country getting into. And this is why we have to constantly keep in mind, reforming the society when it comes to economy means also reforming the society when it comes to values embedded in our education system, elementary and high school, so that people who are completing the education system in this country trust that they know about themselves, they respect the identity of Serbs or citizens of Serbia, irrespective of their other nationalities, that, but they have to be aware of this. And Europeans at the same time being completely open for the values which are defining European Union as a part of the transatlantic yeah. entity. Yeah. Thank you.
Uh, and thank you uh, for uh, participating in this. Thank, uh, I also thank the audience. I just want to, end, uh, to, 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 to finish up by saying that I'm pleasantly surprised, considering that we had a mixture of academics, politicians, and hardline journalists, but essentially people with a lot of hard experience in politics to hear how many times the word dream and the necessity to keep on dreaming was mentioned here. So dream on and uh, uh, I can't wait for the next forum. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure.